Hello and welcome to this Leaders Live event, the first one for 2021 and the first of a series of what I'm sure will be a fascinating set of discussions across the Leaders Live series. Thank you for joining today. My name is Nick Reed, and I'll be hosting the event. Uh, I founded Reed Mobility, a consultancy working towards safer, more ethical, more equitable transport systems, and that's our topic for today, road safety. And the goal of the second decade of action for road safety announced by the United Nations, the headline to achieve a 50% reduction in the number of deaths and injuries on the, on the roads worldwide. It's a topic about which I'm very passionate and I know the uh, members of the panel today are as well. And I'm sure many of you are having joined this call. Um, and is it, is it mission impossible? That's the topic for discussion. And we've got a fantastic panel to discuss this, but before we introduce them, a couple of points of housekeeping. We will be putting some uh, questions to the audience through the discussion today. Um, so we'll be using the Menti platform for that. So uh, please use the uh, instructions on the screen for connecting to that using uh, menti.com and the, and the number shown on the screen, the code. Um, please use uh, a separate browser window or your phone as, as appropriate. Don't navigate away from the YouTube screen, obviously. And then the second point is that uh, in the second half of the discussion today, I'll be putting uh, questions and comments from the audience to the panel. So if you have any questions or comments, please do use the comments box in the YouTube stream to do that. So first question then, uh, simple, simple questions, simple answers, but uh, a complex topic. Do you think halving global road deaths by 2030 is achievable? Yes, no, or don't know? And Really, I want you to think about this you know, from your knowledge of technology, from your knowledge of behaviours, from your knowledge of policy. Do you think achieving a halving of global road deaths by 2030 is achievable? OK, and while those uh, while those results come in, I'll ask our esteemed uh, panellists to introduce themselves. So first up, uh, Professor Natasha Merritt from the University of Leeds. Natasha, please introduce yourself and, and your work. Thank you, Nick. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, I am a professor of human factors and transport systems at the University of Leeds Institute for Transport Studies. Uh, and my work has been around understanding users' interactions with new technologies. And in the last 10, 15 years, particularly looking at what is called automated vehicles, some call it driverless cars, understanding what drivers uh, limitations are and also looking at pedestrians and others road users interactions with these technologies. Thank you. Thank you Natasha and, and second uh, Dr Daniel Ruith from Zenzik. Thank you Nick, um, very good to be here. I'm the CEO of Zenzik which I have been since shortly after its launch in September 2017. Uh, for those of you who don't know Zenzik is the hub for testing and development of connected and automated mobility in the UK and uh, a key area of focus for Zenzik is in shaping the uniquely interoperable cluster of comprehensive testing facilities that we call CAM Testbed UK. And a key component of interoperability is, lies in the single safety framework that's been developed and has been rolled out for use by the facilities themselves and those using the facilities from concept through to commercial deployment. Uh, and it's one common framework which is aligned with the evolving regulations for cabs. Brilliant. Thanks, Daniel. And we'll get into some of Zenzik's work over the course of discussions, I'm sure. Um, third, we have uh, Aaron Srinivas, and Aaron is uh, Executive Vice President at Bosch Mobility Solutions UK, and also importantly in this context as well, Chairman of the uh, charitable uh, partnership RoadSafe. Aaron. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, thanks for uh, organising this session and, and sort of steering it as well. Um, I'm responsible for Bosch Mobility Solutions in the UK that um, is inclusive of all of the automotive business we do in the UK, uh, but more importantly then looking wider beyond uh, just components into automobiles, looking at the mobility ecosystem itself and see what role we can play in terms of um, zero accidents, clean air and relaxed and comfortable driving and um, clearly that's where um, we are committed, uh, having been sort of technology providers for the auto industry for safety technology for quite a while. And of course, the road safe hat is then the 
ability to translate all of these good technologies into actual uh, technology that is valuable for end users. I think that's the fundamental focus of RoadSafe. And we'll talk a little more about it during the course of the session. Thank you very much. I'm sure, I'm sure. And last but by no means least, uh, David Ward. David is the president and CEO of the Towards Zero Foundation. David. Yeah, well, Nick, thanks very much. And it's a great opportunity and great panel to be in. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, yeah, we, we are um, uh, independent charity based in the UK, but we work globally. Um, and some of our work is just pure advocacy. So we were very involved in the campaign to establish the UN targets uh, to halve road deaths um, by, by 2030. And we, we play a, a role in different UN bodies, work closely with the WHO and UN Road Safety Collaboration. One of our major projects is the Global New Car Assessment Program, mm -hmm. where we do a consumer rating of um, vehicle safety uh, in many of these emerging markets. And we also um, work with Bosch and other, other suppliers in a, a partnership called the Stop the, Crash Partnership, Stop the Crash Partnership, which is promoting crash avoidance technology technologies. Brilliant. Thank you, David. And uh, maybe just if we can start then by looking at the results of that first question. Uh, we've got a slight majority favouring yes, that, global, that it is achievable to halve global road deaths by 2030. But by the same token, more than half saying that it's no or they don't know. So I'll be very interested to see how that tracks when we return to this question at the end of the discussion, see if any of you, many of you have changed your minds. Maybe you think it's less achievable having heard the discussion. So, so let's see what happens as we move on later. Um, but the first question to you, David, I mean, since the, since the 60s, the, uh, the number of um, fatalities on the road year on year has tended to decrease, um, not least because of some of that work you've described with the FIA Foundation, Global NCAP and, and Towards Zero Foundation. But in the 2010s, at least, for Europe and the US, there was something of a, of a plateau, the, the first decade of action for road safety. I wondered, maybe you could explain that and, and put it in a global context. Yeah, um, I mean, the decade which has just finished, the first, first decade of action had as its goal um, to stabilize and then reduce road traffic deaths. And when you go back to 2009, which was the kind of benchmark 2009-10 for the decade, the WHO World Health Organization um, in its first global status report, which was the first time that there'd ever been a, a fully country by country assessment of road safety. It was forecasting that by 2030, um, the total number of road deaths annually would go up to 2.4 million. Now that trend has not happened. And in fact, if you look over the last decade, um, there's basically been a stabilization uh, factor. And, um, I'm not going to talk so much about the high income countries at the moment, but if you, because really the 90% of these road, road deaths are occurring in, in developing countries. And that's where there's been both substantial population growth and huge increase in motorization. Yes. So if you take those things together, then actually I would say that the decade of action in the last, uh, the last one uh, up till 2020 has been a, a pretty good success because more or less stabilization has happened. Um, now, of course, that's only half, half what we wanted uh, in the sense you wanted to stabilize and then reduce. And we haven't seen significant reductions. But overall, I think the, the first decade has achieved uh, quite a lot. And it's important to, uh, that, that, that on this side, I'm on the optimistic side of, of things. Um, and I think there are lots of uh, interesting developments over this decade. I think one of the most important things is there's been a better understanding of the policy mix uh, of what works. Um, typically, uh, back in 2009 and, and pre the, the last decade, if you spoke to decision makers and policy makers, transport ministers and so on in many of these developing countries, they would simply go back to the old sort of, well, let's, let's fix the human error, let's concentrate on driver education and so on. Um, we've moved far beyond that. There's not a much better understanding of the role, the interaction of the role of road users, safer vehicles, safer roads. Um, and we have, we're moving into a much more mature understanding of what people call the safe systems approach. Yes. So I think conceptually we're in a better place. And then the other thing that the decade has done, it has energized and created networks globally, which didn't exist before. 
the big problem is we haven't got enough uh, global funding and that road safety, as if you compare it with other major public health issues, it's very poorly funded. But uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit, my answer to this about the past is it's a, it's a bit, uh, is a cup half full, half empty. I, I tend to be an optimist, so I think it's half full. Yes, and it, as ever, it depends which statistics you use, right, to, to, to come to that judgment. But um, Arun, David kind of alluded to it there. One of the hot topics for the 2010s was the development of assisted and automated driving systems. Um, Certainly, on the automated side, progress hasn't necessarily been as quick as, as it had been, as had been expected, at least uh, to, to the midpoint of the decade. Um, but there is this new raft of, of technologies coming in for, for new vehicles in Europe. Um, so I wondered what's Bosch's perspective on this and, and Bosch's roadmap for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the coming decade. Let me begin by saying the technology for automated driving is there. It's the use case and it's also the uptake in the technology because of affordability, which is pushing the corridor mm. further back. Uh, but that being said, you know, having started with the ABS in 1978, the ESP in 1995, Airbag 1980, et cetera. So the, the industry is extremely innovative. And, mm. uh, and, and I think the focus, at least for the next few years, is certainly the rollout of a lot of new features that, are now mandatory through European legislation. Hopefully the UK will adapt that very soon. Is automated emergency braking for vehicle detection in the first phase and also pedestrian and cycling detection in the second phase starting 2022, 2024, and depending upon whether it's new vehicles or old vehicles. And then of course, lane keep uh, systems and, and drowsiness detection systems. So there's an entire uh, spectrum of uh, features that are being developed the, the good thing about this is that we learn a lot as we go on and, and there's a huge number of um, features that are yet being proved for robustness over the years, a lot of testing that's happening in the background. And all of these will continue to enhance uh, road safety as we, as we currently know. But perhaps an interesting uh, point to mention as well is, is connectivity. And I think connectivity will play a very significant part in the immediate future with regard to road safety, and that's applicable not just in advanced countries with, um, you know, pigment rates for some of these newer systems uh, already at a fairly high level, but it's, it's something that we should perhaps from, from David Ward's perspective, you know, take that flag and fly it worldwide because some of the emerging markets are pretty hot on connectivity, and that is for us a huge um, leverage to try and, you know, achieve this halving by 2030. That's one example when, when connectivity does play a part, and that's uh, our, our sort of uh, wrong way driver warning system, which runs on a Bosch cloud, uh, which will go into the market this year. And it's, it's simple things like that, um, simple in, in terms of additional sensors that are required, but very, very effective. And, and what um, the end result is, if you, if you see, there will be roughly four and a half thousand incidents Europe wide of people driving the wrong way. And, and um, you know, there are, of, of course, um, deaths related to that and serious injuries. And this would be a good opportunity to, to try and, um, you know, get that one uh, area also covered. And, and it's aspects like this, event data recorder, intelligent speed sensing, um, assistance systems, tire pressure monitoring, these are all on the anvil, um, not just from Bosch, but primarily from us, but most others as well, uh, which will hit the market very soon. So, you know, it's a very promising landscape um, and regulation hopefully will, will uh, you know, keep pace with it and uh, push the market towards that uh, improved safety world. Yeah, and, and so picking up on that, that connectivity point and, one of the most, uh, well, I guess, one of the flagship outcomes from Zenzik to date, Daniel, is the uh, the roadmap that you've produced around the emergence of connected and automated vehicle technologies to yes, 2030, yes. covering the decade of action for road safety. I Absolutely. wondered, yeah, maybe say some more about the, the roadmap and how that uh, might play out in terms of road safety. Yes, because I think, and I think it's really important to emphasize the C. Uh, we, we talk about autonomy, we really should be talking about automation more with that auto autonomy at one end of that spectrum. And then we must ram home the importance of C, especially in terms of low hanging fruit. And the challenge, of course, is that, that there are little bits of fruit, uh, individual 
and that's a fantastic example that Aaron gave, which deals with 4,000 or so of, of the examples or incidents, which is a fraction of the total number of incidents. And we need to deal with each of them and then collectively put them together. And the reason for the roadmap is to be able to see in a simple way what all those different uh, activities are, where the milestones are that we need to achieve uh, and how they're interdependent. Um, it was, uh, as many of you are probably aware, created through workshops and, and, a, and a high degree of consensus between over 200 organizations. So it's not the Zenzik view of the world or the Zenzik view of the future. It is the world view of the world future and how it will progress. Most recently, it's been updated with um, what we've been, we, we've labeled CAM creators. So organizations that are following the roadmap, using it for their strategies, 200 of them, more than 200 again, have come in and said, well, this is the rate of progress we're making and this is our trajectory. And that's where it becomes really, really useful because it can help organizations derive, develop, uh, enhance their own strategies, de-risk everything because they know that they're running in, in, kind of in, in a crowd with everybody else rather than um, going off in some, some random direction at risk of, uh, of missing out on the collective um, investment. Um, and I'm going to kind of reinforce what Aaron said, because the narrative of the roadmap is very clear. Uh, it implies what we expect and what we need to achieve progressively over the coming decade. And it again, beg begins with the C. Uh, and I'll kind of be cheeky and say it's a C for congestion, because congestion reduction, uh, for example, through green light optimization or management of the fleet as a whole, in, in examples like that, that one, the wrong way traffic one, uh, those those linking together of the whole fleet are going to have the greatest impact, I believe, not just on safety, but of course on uh, inclusion, on in, on productivity and on the environment. Because if we can deal with the whole fleet progressively and start to deal with it now, bef way before we have universal autonomy, then we are going to uh, improve the environment, the, the kind of the production of CO2 from tailpipe emissions from uh, brake and, and uh, tire particulates is gonna reduce more rapidly than if we kind of focus purely on autonomy. Uh, and, and the milestones that we need to achieve are in the roadmap. Um, congestion also causes disruption and distraction, which in itself can result in incidents and incidents quite often result in fatalities. I actually want to ask a question later on about has the economic impact of road incidents improved, not just the, the, the are we just stabilised deaths or have we uh, also reduced incidents which cause harm? And, and as we know, sometimes uh, an injury is more expensive to the, to the country than, than, than a death. So that's there. Um, so collectivity is absolutely critical to, to, to achieving those early wins. Automation all, already improves safety tangibly, and ADAS we'll talk about later on, um, the various types of it, from the early impact of ABS to the more recent and very much established now effects of adaptive cruise control. It's when then when C and A, connectivity and autonomy, come together that we have the potential to address the full risks. And we got that kind of targeting a Russian doll of people yes. uh, or, or kind of the Russian doll, which is road users, vehicles, the vehicle fleet and the entire mobility system. Uh, it's big thinking, but I, I think we have the opportunity now as we come out of the pandemic to reboot and actually realign where all the thinkers come in and make sure that silos are broken down and we actually can achieve this goal of halving uh, road deaths by the end of the decade. Yeah. I mean, picking up on those um, advanced driver assistance systems, this ADAS functions, some of them, Arun mentioned ABS, uh, anti-lock braking systems, ESP, stability protection, AEB, autonomous emergency braking systems. Some of those seem to work because, to some degree because the driver doesn't know when and how they're about to be used. Um, as we move towards more automated systems, there is perhaps an opportunity for, for drivers to start to game the system more and, and push the systems beyond what they're um, really capable of. Um, so Natasha, I was, I was wondering if you had views on, well, I'm, I'm sure you do. I don't need to ask that question, um, but I wondered your views on the human factors challenges of deploying automated uh, driving systems. Thanks, Nick. Yes, um, hopefully you have the same views. We'll see. Um, so <laughs> the, the systems you mentioned, um, I very much think of them as safety systems, crash avoidance systems. Um, so you, your ABSs, ESCs, etc. Um, when we move to automated systems, 
like combining adaptive cruise control and lane keeping, um, then it becomes more around convenience and comfort. And so it's slightly different, at least in my head, regarding uh, whether they're going to save lives. Mm. Um, they they pro provide that comfort. So very much the push is around um, helping drivers do other things. That's one of the things that manufacturers have said in the past. And so the, the human factor challenge very much comes um, around what does that mean to the human? What do they understand is the capability of the system? Is that the same as the capability of the system? And of course, the challenge is very much around the system working almost all the time uh, and very well. And it basically puts us into this um, misunderstanding of and comfort as, OK, this system is foolproof and we become complacent and uh, we start to get bored and look around, maybe look on our phones a little bit more. And that's unfortunately where the challenge, so that playing like you saying, that is where it comes in. And, uh, you know, we've been studying this for quite a few years now. How do we um, create the right trust mm -hmm. for, for drivers? So um, not just allowing them to trust it without, uh, you know, without questioning it, uh, but making sure they trust it enough to allow, for example, the ACC to work and help them, but to always be observant of what the ACC is and is not capable of. If there's something happening in the road that the ACC cannot manage, um, they are aware and they are monitoring. Uh, and of course, again, the human factors challenge is that uh, we, we don't know what those situations are all the time. So that monitoring is something that is quite difficult for us to do. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes, half an hour, we get bored. Uh, and it's that, that balance, really, that we really need to still work on. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that this will come as a, as a, with a, a package of, of measures on the vehicle, that many of those will reduce risk but possibly introduce new risks. And what, what does that balance look like? How does that play out? Um, so speaking of um, driver assistance systems, uh, I'm going to um, go to our second uh, audience question. Uh, so if we could bring that up, that is, um, do you use any advanced driver assistance ADAS functions fitted to your car? Now, there are multiple responses to this. So I'd like you to, to make sure you read the, the responses to that question very carefully. Um, but yeah, I'd be really interested to see um, the extent to which people use those ADAS functions and whether they feel they do bring genuine safety benefits. While that, uh, while that poll plays out, um, Daniel, you had a, I think you had your hand up there briefly for, did you want to respond to? Um... No, no, very briefly, because I was asked, gonna ask uh, Natasha about the, the human factors angle outside the car because i know you've done some work in leeds looking at, at, at uh, pedestrians um i'm wondering whether you've gone beyond pedestrians or what you can tell us about the pedestrians uh, and and um other sustainable road users yes that's a really nice question thank you um my pleasure <laughs> so yes we we have started to look and actually that this area has gone in the last few years because there's been, uh, you know, some thoughts around, hang on a minute, when, when there's no driver in the automated vehicle of the future, then how are we as pedestrians and other road users going to understand the behavior of that vehicle? Because right now, as people, as humans, we might sort of, um, you know, move our hands or, or have eye contact, etc. cetera. Um, the first thing to say is actually, contrary to belief, myself included, there isn't that much explicit interaction and communication between us as road users. So what we tend to use, uh, pedestrians and cyclists, is the behavior of the vehicle itself to try and decide, is it stopping for me? Is it gonna carry on moving, etc. So this is a really fresh area where the interactions going forward need to be understood. And the, the place where it's really needing more research is when there's effectively a standoff. So we're trying to share the same space and we, we just don't know how to move on uh, because the automated vehicle doesn't have any kind of messaging or whatever. So working on what is called external human machine interfaces, some kind of lighting, um, but 
the jury's out, let's put it that way, because there's a lot of discussions around what color it should be, whether, you know, where it should be, etc. But yes, definitely moving forward, we need to move be- beyond the driver inside the vehicle, especially as I'm sure David will confirm, if there has been any rise in in um, crashes, etc., it is around those vulnerable road users. Mm. That's where mm. we need to focus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I may just end on that, Nick. Um, Please, sir. Yeah. Natasha makes a very valid point um, with regard to the acceptability of technology because the industry faces the challenge of trying to get the fitment rate high enough so we see the effect of these safety measures on actual roads as we each drive. But part of that is is because we are unable to place as an industry the benefits of this as as viable, useful tools for drivers. And, And that has to do with driver training. It has to do with the way we all take our driving tests there could be an education module that goes with it has nothing to do with the assessment module it just exposes you to a new technology and and i'll hand over in a minute to david because he's got a lot to say about stop the crash which was a partnership we are part of uh, with yourselves and others as well but it's exactly that when the penny drops when you've been in a car which has these features you realize how useful that is now and that then helps to drive down the cost of this technology in, in everyday use. And David, just while you while you consider your response there, looking at the results of the poll, uh, very interesting that the, the majority of responses there saying that the ADAS functions do make the owners of those vehicles feel safer. Um, many many people who don't have those functions so uh, yeah clearly that's uh, that's a, a different dimension but uh, yeah the, the overwhelming majority they're saying that they do make them feel safe only one person said that the ADAS functions make them feel less safe so yeah maybe that's slightly concerning but uh, yeah the, the majority they're saying that they do feel safer through the presence of those ADAS functions which is which is pleasing to see. Uh, sorry uh, Nick can I pick on that very quickly because the, the six saying no I do not use them Mm. Uh, they may be people like my wife who doesn't use them because she's scared of what they could do. So so that and the one go together to make seven, which starts to make it a very substantial uh, number. And it comes back to the point about training. Uh, and and uh, one question I have in my mind about young people and how you can make them safer because they tend to be involved in a lot of accidents. They, their vehicles don't have um, uh, this type of ADAS equipment quite often because they can't afford it. Somehow though, we need to incentivize them to get them and to use them and to be trained to use them. Uh, if, that, if that's the alternative to my plan, which is to lock them all up and uh, not let them drive at all, which I'm not, not sure is really viable. <laughs> no, absolutely right, Daniel. And, and yeah, the, the no, I do not use them and, and no, I don't know what functions my car has. I mean, that, that's an interesting group as mm. well, right? So not understanding that these functions are present and do provide benefit is, uh, is also a, a, a key demographic to, to hit. Um, David, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I, I, and a couple of points I wanted to make. I mean, one going back to your very first question about uh, can we can we halve deaths by globally by by twenty thirty? So I'm I'm optimistic about this, and I think one of the contributors will be big improvements in in vehicle technology. Together with, it's very important. It's not in isolation. It's together with improved road infrastructure, better police enforcement. There's that whole mix. And also probably another important feature of this is going to be blending into environmental issues and reduced car dependency and so on. But the the vehicle technology piece, I would say of the total that we are trying to, uh, of the halving, perhaps 30% of that could come from from new vehicle technologies. And just to put some scale on this, over the next decade, despite the pandemic, where we're probably in automotive production having a V-shaped downturn, if we revert to the previous growth trend uh, of the first um, uh, 20 years of this, of this decade, which was 2.4% growth in annual vehicle uh, production, between now and 2030, there'll be about 1.4 billion new motor vehicles, new passenger cars being produced. Uh, even if you take a more gloomy view, you know, it's just a billion or so. Whatever one thinks about these scenarios, we are facing a world of a huge extra increase in, in, in vehicles. Uh, and that's a fleet already, the, the, the global fleet in use is probably about 1.5 at the moment. 
So we're facing a huge new cohort of vehicles. The other really important thing is that more than 50% of those vehicles are in middle and low income countries. Uh, they are now the dynamic center of the automotive industry. And when it comes to a lot of these technologies and the regulations that are linked to them, they are not yet up to speed at all. So we're still trying to get to first base, if you like, in some basic crash test standards, the early uh, crash avoidance systems, like electronic stability control, for instance. And what's encouraging, and this is another good bit about the last decade, the single most improved technology over the last decade has been greater uptake of electronic stability control. And that has been driven in these emerging markets by new car assessment programs, including in their rating, and by governments regulating. But we've still got some very important new markets to, to take that action. Uh, Brazil is supposed to be doing it, but they're slightly delayed because of COVID. India has promised to do it. Uh, but it's absolutely vital that these technologies spread over the next decade. And I think that will deliver impressive, impressive gains. And then following on from that, a total emergency braking and, and so on. And these, I don't like the phrase low hanging fruit, but these are really the technologies that will deliver over the next decade. And in the whole question about full autonomy, just to put this in perspective, I'm talking about, let's say, for argument's sake, another billion vehicles over the next decade. What percentage of them will be anything like level five full autonomy by 2030? I think less than 5%. So my brutal comment about full autonomy, I'm talking about full autonomy, what contribution would it make to reducing deaths and, uh, and serious injuries by 2030? My answer is zero, nothing. Because it'll happen in the safest countries, in highly safe environments, geofenced environments, all the rest of it. The real challenge is actually to spread the benefits of the technologies we already know work throughout the world, and especially in these middle-income uh, in environments. That is where you get the, the positive yes. reduction towards 2030. Yes. And, and Daniel, you, you want to respond? Yes, so, so I agree absolutely with what you just said, David. In fact, so does, uh, I think, Dame Chilia uh, on, on the YouTube channel saying that there's a need for a cultural change. Uh, and it begs the question, what we're trying to change, therefore, is the driver behavior and the, the, the people, the human behavior, far more than, than being able to assume technology will, will support us. And that's not quite true, because, of course, one of the, the things that has made a big difference in, in uh, developed, developed countries like the UK has been the implementation of black boxes. Uh, and, it, and so that you can monitor and, and incentivize, incentivize good behavior. So it's a change in the business model to a certain extent. That's linked to connectivity, which is my kind of current mantra. Uh, and, and therefore, do you think that uh, those kind of tools are going to have more impact and are going to make the difference in, in the decade around the world uh, rather than some of the other uh, mechanisms? Is that a question to me? <laughs> so, yeah, well, yeah, I suppose so. Yes. Um, yes, up to a point. I mean, I, I, I still think I, I'm, uh, it, it's sometimes... Um, uh, I, I, the world, the weird world I live in, where I'm dealing with crash test standards in Latin America, so it's like a discussion 20 years ago in Europe, mm. where we're just trying to get minimum crash worthiness in the right place. Now that's sort of been happening, so that that's good progress. Um, I'm also slightly cautious about um, any anything that suggests we're going to fix all of this by fixing human behaviour, because that really is mission impossible. Mm. Human behavior constantly veers off in different directions. And any technology, anything you, anything you introduce, it, it, human, humans have this capacity to sort of um, take it to an extreme and all the rest of it. What we actually need to do is try, and this is the essence of the safe system approach, is, is encourage both in the way we manage roads and road design and vehicles to minimize the consequences of human error rather than trying to, to fix it. Mm. And so, uh, but I agree with you that things like uh, black box recorders and all of those things, they all help uh, uh, in create an environment where road users, both inside and outside the vehicle, maybe uh, and other, other measures too, will help them sort of stick to the basic rules. Mm. And really that, you know, that's, that's essential. But uh, my own personal um, uh, sense of this is that if you look at the whole history of road safety and road injury prevention over the last 30, 40 years, 
there's been a steady shift in progress away from reliance exclusively on behavioral towards hard wiring in infrastructure and vehicles, systems that are fail safe. And I still think that's the direction we need to go. Yeah. Uh, Natasha, I, you, you, you've your hand up and I was going to bring you in anyway. I was sure you would want to uh, to comment at this point. Um, so, so David's saying we, we can't... Yeah. We can't shape human behavior, but but uh, maybe you're inter- you, I mean you, you're interested in in studying it and and perhaps influencing it in positive ways. So yeah, I wondered your view. No, absolutely. I mean, I I don't fully disagree um, with David. Um, I always say we like to break things, um, and engineers put things in that we just love breaking. Um, but I think the main issue is that. There is still, and Daniel has used the word silo, there's not enough interaction between us. So I don't really agree with this sort of idea of let's put systems in place um, and then see how people react to them and whether they accept them, because we need to understand more um, what humans want. And a really simple picture that I always show in my in my presentations is you know if I want to get from from um, A to B and I'm walking um, the path that's created by engineers makes me go all the way around and I just want to get from A to B why is that design and of course there is reasons for that from the planning and engineer side of things but um, we need to basically understand what the human wants from these systems and what what um, what they cannot do rather than, uh, you know, just providing um, technology for the sake of it, what they're not good at um, and and helping them in that regard. And of course, then we want that kind of system because nobody wants to die, right? So I think it is that sort of bringing the engineering angle and the human um, needs together more will make sure that whatever we whatever is provided to us, we, we accept it, we adopt it, we use it, um, and we don't misuse it. And just one final point, I love the fact that Daniel's mentioned young people, and you've mentioned low and middle income countries, etc. Um, pretty much everything that is designed is not by any of those people. Mm-hmm. So again, looking at the you know what I call the sort of tales of the normal distribution uh, what do women want need what do old people need etc that's where we need to focus on so that we've got everybody on board so that you know the people who are dying from these um, as a result of these crashes um, don't basically <laughs> so Aaron maybe, one, maybe oh, yeah please mention perhaps offer an olive branch because uh, Safe system is, is, is certainly, in my perspective, a very uh, important um, aspect, but perhaps we should include the human being in the system as well and not leave the human being out. And I'd like, you know, to, to make the comment that human factors engineering is part of our research and development as well. And we'd like to understand those aspects and Natasha's point uh, to, to further enhance these features. So when we actually take it onto the road, it's something that's more intuitive. People understand it automatically and it works. You don't need a, much more of a, um, you know, uh, a vote than, than that. And of course, if the people use it, then the take rate increases, the technology costs drop. And that's also part of saving lives in a, in a broader sense. Mm. Yes, I, I don't want to. I agree with with everything uh, that's being said. I mean, part of the uh, human interface engineering is is part of the safe system. Um, I'm, I'm really thinking of the very old school, uh, mm. um, just rely on on education. And also, another problem is there's a cliche which is used all over the place that 94 percent of road deaths are caused by driver error. And frankly, this is it's kind of nonsense. And the studies that when you actually examine the studies that this is based on, they don't even say that. And the, some the NHTSA ones, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration studies, that all they actually say is that driver error is the last identifiable cause in a chain. Mm. And the key thing is, is what's in the chain. And some of the errors are actually design errors, bad intersection designs, or all the fact that an error because the government has failed to have crash test standards when it should have done 20 years ago. So, you know, in fact, the answer really is 100%. It's all human error, apart from sort of acts of God. So, the, but it's very misleading, the, the 94%. 
And it then also does, I think, enormous disservice to the people in favor of, of, of AVs or autonomous vehicles because they, they come up with these ridiculous um, assessments. Well, because it's 94%, then we can get rid of 94% of 1.3 million. This is total nonsense. Um, the way to build the case for AVs is sort of bottom up, um, uh, literally in each different community and road usage. Um, but I think one of the attractions, for example, of a technology like electronic stability control, and it brings me to that one where there are 12 people saying does not have ADAS function. They, they do. It's called electronic stability control. They have no choice. If they bought a, a car in the UK and Europe uh, since 2012, they had to have it. And that's the advantage also of AED. These systems are, are there whether you kind of want them or not, and they will work whether you want them or not. And I think that's part of where I think we have to go. In the end, we have to have these systems mandatorily applied. And, and finally, because I, I, just my last point is, I think one of the really important technologies that we're going to have to really promote is intelligent speeder system. And it is part of the EU package that is due to come in from July uh, next year, where speed control, uh, the car should um, follow the speed limit. There will be an override, of, it will be an override of the system. But given the extreme importance of speed uh, and limiting speed in improving any crash outcome, uh, I think ISA is going to be an extremely important technology and a real precursor to public acceptance of more sophisticated what are the Things arguments against uh, signing off ISA? Um, well, it's 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 going to be applied in Europe anyway, so that's it's already happening now. Mm. There are issues about exactly how the technology will work, and there's a complicated issue between um, the quality of the infrastructure, the ability of the of the systems to read road signs, and the complexity of road signs. So there are going to be obligations. This is another connectivity issue. There can be obligations on governments to make sure that their road signs are compatible with these systems. Um, but I think there's very, there's very little uh, argument you can mount against it. Um, one or two in the industry, uh, car manufacturers, opposed the introduction of it in Europe and said it's too early. We disagreed with them. Uh, they wanted a kind of 100% um, uh, compliance. And we said, well, no technology works 100% of the time, so why are you setting such a high bar? Um, and I think it, it was interesting, the manufacturers who complained about that most, I would say, are the ones who, who actually rather like performance and speed as part of their marketing. And I think they, um, they find ISO a little bit challenging to their kind of core brand identity. But the trials and the usage of ISO at the moment suggest that most people do not speed because they really want to drive fast. They speed involuntarily. And uh, if, you, if you can have this system working in your favor, it's kind of relaxing form of, of driving and you don't worry about getting the ticket. Um, and once we get a big threshold of vehicles, if we get to the point where something like 30, 40% of the vehicles have these systems, um, which could be the case by 2030, it will be like a massive traffic calming effect mm. uh, with benefits on the environment as well as, as, well as safety. Yeah. Yes, and, and certainly... Natasha's department, the, the Institute for Transport Studies at, at Leeds, have done a huge amount of research on the, the effects of ISA. So, yeah, good, good resource there. Um, just one final question, I think, first, first for Arun and then Daniel, before we move on to the audience questions. A lot of what we've discussed kind of hinges on the effectiveness of systems, and, and you understand the effectiveness of systems through data and statistical analysis. So I wondered, you know, Bosch, with it, the scale of its operation, perhaps has... How does Bosch see that data um, resource in terms of uh, uh, addressing road safety topics? Quite significant, uh, Nick, because um, we, we know a, a lot from our own systems that are applied to vehicles and we've got data streaming quite continuously from, from all of these things. And they advise us naturally on on developing future products uh, to better um, capabilities, perhaps cheaper, perhaps uh, differently, but more importantly, the intelligence behind the data is of course, uh, how do we then enhance and translate these into features and functions? So I think data is a very significant part of it. Uh, and then if you apply artificial intelligence and be able to model that data and, and draw inferences from that, that takes you into an entirely different uh, plane altogether. So I think, yes, we'd like to. And then the 
can, uh, you know, we spoke a bit about connectivity. It's about connecting our data with the ecosystem's data, whether it's mm. traffic around the city of Birmingham or, or London and, and, you know, the pace of traffic. And then you begin to use embedded information like uh, friction of the road and, and look at road surface monitoring, uh, you know, measure the friction uh, across the entire stretch of road and see how we can advise passengers of potentially black ice somewhere ahead of the uh, uh, journey or, you know, it's, it's connecting all of this for us is, is the ultimate um, value of data because we actually then put it in the hands of users of these technologies for their own safety. And, and Daniel, a, a word on Zenzik's role in, in aggregating and, and exploring data? Uh, well, the, the most prominent role is in shaping uh, and, and now launching a, a system called Convex. Uh, so you just talked about it. Um, I, I think Convex is particularly exciting because it's, it's a way of making sure that the data flows and turned into insights ultimately, uh, and those that generate it benefit as well as those that are using it uh, to their own purposes. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, collective activity. Um, I, I think it's, 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 it's prompted a lot of excitement um, incredible feedback, but it is a fundamental part of what we of Camtest Bed UK because Camtest Bed UK is literally about taking any concept right through to commercialization, and that has to be wrapped up in the data and the business models that then will draw on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic discussion, guys. So there's been some incredible questions. Really, obviously, very um, intelligent and engaged audience we have today. Um, I, I think the first one I'd like to ask. Uh, I think perhaps to you, Natasha. What is the role or capability of uh, driver state and driver monitoring technologies to mitigate the frequency and consequences of, of drink driving is specified, but I guess perhaps generally uh, driver state monitoring? Yeah, I love this question. It's um, exactly my passion at the moment. So the, the um, promise is, is there. But um, as with everything else at the moment, um, we need more data, we need more understanding. So um, I know that Euro NCAP is working on it and pushing different levels of, uh, so already the sort of coffee cup um, concept is there in terms of uh, the lane keeping, et cetera, for vehicles. And there is a move to go on to sort of head uh, and, uh, sorry, eye tracking and uh, make, become more intelligent so that by 2024, um, understanding what the driver is doing and whether or not they're capable of taking over uh, the automated vehicle. Um, however, uh, we are still trying to understand, you know, the technology in terms of sort of uh, where the eyes are looking and what that means in terms of whether you're distracted, whether you're fatigued. Uh, we still don't really have enough data on that. So I think um, we, you know, it's it's already, as I say, uh, to be implemented and uh, vehicles are going to get um, NCAP um, ratings based on it, but we still need to get a bit more just because if it's not done properly, as I've said with my other, uh, the other topics, basically the drivers will not use it. So they are, they're sort of messages, for example, about people sticking, um, sort of putting a sticky tape on the camera uh, because it's annoying. Uh, and so what we don't want is for drivers to hate the warnings and turn them off and actually um, not use them when they're supposed to be there to, keep, um, to save lives. Yes. Yeah, there, there have been a, a couple of questions related to the effects of the pandemic and, and how that's affecting traffic. An interesting one we had was around uh, the growth of curbside deliveries following the, the, the pandemic and the potential for that to, to increase conflicts with vulnerable road users. Um, so I guess uh, maybe David, uh, yeah, that you might have stressed drivers trying to keep to a timetable in larger vehicles operating in um, residential environments is, is is that a cause for concern? Yeah, I think I have a. This is where I'm going to slightly go more into the pessimistic scenario. Uh, I actually think that the pandemic is a bit of a setback for um, multimodal transport shift. I think that mm. getting people back into, into public transport and uh, is going to be a big struggle. And it's interesting in emerging markets. There's some evidence of this where. Uh, I've seen market research um, surveys showing that um, people are uh, more likely to buy a vehicle than ever before. Um, so I think this is, in one sense, good news for the car industry. 
because I, I think the, the chances are they're going to go back to a very positive growth trend. And exactly as you say, commercial vehicles, we're seeing huge changes to our distribution systems and our high streets and so on, and, uh, and work patterns. And that's going to affect all of this too. And I think it is likely that we're going to see more commercial vehicles in use, um, which, by the way, brings you back to the same uh, rather important story is that um, commercial vehicles are, are quite a bit behind on the um, fitment of, of life-saving technologies um, like AEB and so on. And I was very pleased Euroncap has just started a rating system for vans. Mm. And, uh, and PAX has done some interesting work in the UK showing that that vans actually are the class of vehicles most involved in fatal crashes. So mm -hmm. there is a vast opportunity in fleet safety and in, um, in commercial vehicles. And I think there's going to be a big push in the next decade to encourage companies to really adopt best practices in fleet safety. It won't be acceptable for their, their brand reputation and also for their duty of care to their employees and others mm -hmm. if their vehicles do not have um, a, a high rating under uh, programs like your your income. And Dan, your response? I, I'd love it. I'd, I'd pick up your pessimism, which I understand, uh, and, and of course turn it around because it's an opportunity, isn't it? Uh, the fact that the public transport is is going is suffering and will continue to suffer. Um, w w the, the the alternative to just shifting shifting straight over to uh, universal car ownership is for shared services. To uh, be developed more rapidly, and for there to be a, a kind of a market driver for the growth of those shared services. So I see it as a, as a bit of a positive. And whether that is uh, around um, personal transport or um, freight and goods movements, because uh, the, the same things apply. And your point about fleet, bang on, uh, David. I absolutely agree that there's there's critical mass, there's volume there. Therefore, there is an incentive to do something right. And a safe fleet quite often is also an efficient fleet. And therefore, a uh, a cost effective fleet. Yeah. So, uh, we're we're nearing the end of the hour. I can't believe how quickly that's flown. But uh, I would like to return to the the poll, the third poll question, which is the the same as the the opening question that we had to, to see if uh, how views have changed. So the question is there: Do you think halving global road deaths by twenty thirty is achievable? And and while we wait for those um, responses to come in. Stop the polls. Uh, no, <laughs> while we wait for those questions to come in, um, I had a final kind of one sentence question for each of you. If you had a magic wand that could help you know, deliver something to help us get to that target of halving road deaths by 2030, what would it be? Maybe, uh, Daniel, we'll start with you. Uh, a bit parochial, it's a UK based thing, but I think that we've got to encourage government. Uh, to do what they're talking about, which is having a call for evidence around connected and automated mobility uh, so that we can actually corral ourselves around this incredibly important agenda, which will lead to uh, improvements in safety. Great, thank you. Arun, your, your magic wand? Uh, if I could wave it, uh, it would be making road safety a national priority as part of societal health and well-being. Uh, it's it's all of us, including the driver here, working together in unison. And this is why I wear the road safe hat, because we bring agencies from across the uh, spectrum to, to be involved and to educate and to uh, regulate. And uh, for me, that would be the one thing. Zero accidents is exactly what uh, we are after. If I may just take a second sentence, we talk a lot about air quality because that's so much in our face and and uh, you know then the right measures are going in and this is exactly the same conversation we should have about road safety as well it's about society's well-being and i think that's an important factor yeah great thank you arun uh, natasha so i agree with daniel but of course um have to include the user very much at the center of this um but also, I want to go back to basics, uh, and we still need to understand uh, distraction. So I think it's it's worse than it was. It's just um, not discussed as much as it used to be, and whether that's the drivers or pedestrians. And um, there has been a rise in, very slight rise in, in pedestrian-related deaths compared to drivers. And... Uh, we don't know why, but my hunch is because of distraction. So I think, uh, you know, I want to go back to basics. 
perfect thank you and and david your magic wand uh my magic wand my my i don't like silver bullets but the nearest we have is better speed management we should try and get speeds down everywhere and this applies universally you know we, we know the human vul vulnerabilities uh to kinetic energy and you know unleashed we all know and in any crash environment if you can knock off some miles per hour you're going to improve survivability so speed controlled by better road design by technology and by better enforcement is the, is to me the, the number one issue great thank you david and that that comment there is, has triggered a, another question that I, I wanted to put to you. So it's something you've talked about in the past, the, the role of urban planning, and it's it's noted in the um, it's noted in the the UN declaration around uh, broader issues of equitable access. Um, yeah, I just wondered about that that interplay between planning and safety, the built environment. Is that for me? Mm. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think there's this whole. Balance, uh, the, 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 the paradigm shift people are talking about is the avoid, avoid shift, improve paradigm, um, where you try and avoid unnecessary travel, you shift to, to, to cleaner, safer modes, and you improve the modes that you have. And I think a big part of that is both a technology part of the story, but it's also about the way in which, particularly in cities, our, our environments are, are designed. And we definitely need a more human-centered city that's less, less car-friendly, um, uh, in many respects. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, uh, closing the poll, I think, I mean, the statistician in me wouldn't want to call any significant differences between the uh, the first poll and the second. It's a similar picture. The majority uh, saying yes, but, uh, but a significant um, minority saying no and, and a number that don't know. I think it just highlights that, um, yeah, there's, there is plenty more work for us all to do. Um, you know, there, there is a balance between optimism and, and pessimism. And, you know, the pessimism is, is what that drives the opportunities and, and finding uh, where we can uh, you know, achieve um, the, the, the goals of the, the, the uh, decade of action for road safety. So uh, Nick, a very interesting session. Arian, you want, you want to comment on that? Yeah, you know, uh, this is interesting because this is global road death. And that's roughly 1.35 1, 1 million, beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that we lose to road fatalities. And uh, I'd like to build a bridge to David Ward, perhaps uh, with regard to Commonwealth Road Safety Initiative and the Global Road Safety Initiative as well, because a lot of technology which we take for granted is not available in those areas. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot we can do in, in just propagating this thing about road safety and the focus on road safety in the emerging markets and, and, and other well-developed countries. I come from India, I know the consequence of road accidents and the number of them that take place there, getting this up the agenda is very important and, um, you know, we can achieve a lot more. David, you want to add to that? <laughs> Second that 100%. That's, uh, it is, it is, it's very important. This, this is a, a major global developmental and public health challenge um, that, is, that is so often a kind of Cinderella subject. And um, that's why it's very good that we have a new decade of action. It's very good that a year ago uh, tomorrow, we had the Stockholm conference uh, on the third, the third global ministerial conference that agreed to this target. It was then subsequently supported by the General Assembly. And, and so we've got the good framework in place. We just now, now need to really have a, a real decade of action and implement the best that we know. Thank you. Well, and as UK PLC, I think we have a lot to help out in this in this space because our our road debt uh, is, is relatively small and and we are one of those advanced countries from a road debt uh, excellent perspective and uh, there's a lot we can do as as a country all right thank you thank you for closing on that uh, that point of optimism I, I think it's been a, a tremendous discussion we've we've covered technology air quality planning data behaviors training speed um the the purpose of the discussion was to explore whether this is mission impossible. And I think it is an ambitious goal to halve road deaths by 2030, it's, but it's not an unreasonable goal. And I think you know, with the work of the organizations presented on this panel, it's not an unreachable goal as well. So fantastic discussion. Thank you panelists for your, your time and inputs today. It's been tremendous. Thank you to the attendees for their engagement and their fantastic questions. Uh, and thank you to, to Leaders Live for offering us the uh, the platform on which to have such a wonderful discussion. So with that, 
I'd like to thank everyone for their inputs again. Uh, stay safe and see you again at the next Leaders Live discussion. Thank you and bye-bye.